worship service here at Providence Presbyterian Church. A warm welcome to our church family who are gathered here this morning, as well as anyone at home who may be uh, watching us on uh, uh, any kind of electronic apparatus. Uh, welcome also to anyone who's uh, visiting with us, uh, either uh, online or here in church. And please know that your presence uh, enhances our worship and God is glorified by your presence with us. Uh, we are led in worship this morning by Reverend James Kraft, uh, and we once again thank him for his service to our church. Uh, a couple announcements. Uh, next Sunday, November 22nd, the annual meeting part one will be held immediately following the 9 a.m. service here in the church. And also on Thursday, November 26th, Thanksgiving Day, we will have a Thanksgiving service here in our sanctuary uh, at 9 a.m. So Thanksgiving service on Thursday, November 26th at 9 a.m. And next Sunday, uh, November 22nd, annual meeting part one immediately following our 9 a.m. service. Are there any other announcements? We, we had a, a lady from here with all their crafts yesterday, and the weather was wonderful. So we had people coming through, and they were able to collect $500. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the crafty ladies uh, who again continue to help us and, and support our church. Uh, my understanding also, thank you to Chuck Hill, who came out and cleared the way of the weeds prior to the, prior to the event. There are no other announcements. Uh, last Sunday, uh, Reverend Carter spoke to us about being prepared. So as we begin our service this morning, let us pause and calm our hearts, uh, calm our minds, prepare our hearts, and let us place ourselves in God's presence. Please join me in this morning's responsive call to worship. O oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up, my eyes are not raised too high. I do, I do not, not occupy myself, myself with the things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like, like a weaned, weaned child is my soul within me. O oh, people of God, hope in the Lord for this time on and forevermore. Let us bow our hearts and worship God. Our hymn of praise this morning is Come Thou Font of Every Blessing. <laughs> Blot out the stain of my sin. 
Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. For I recognize my shameful deeds. They haunt me day and night. Again, it's you and you alone have I sinned. I have done what is evil in your sight. You will be proved right in what you said, and your judgment against me is just. Don't keep looking at my sin. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. You would not be pleased with sacrifices, for I would bring them. The sacrifice you want is a broken spirit. A broken and repentant heart, O God, you will not despise. David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan replied, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven you, and you won't die for this sin. But you have given the enemies of the Lord a great opportunity to despise and blaspheme him. Father in heaven, as David found forgiveness through your gracious love, when he repented of his sin, we thank you for the forgiveness that is ours through the death and resurrection sake of your promise and according to your will, 
You have done all these great things and have shown them to me. How great you are, O sovereign Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us praise God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Peter, then to the twelve, 
Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive at this writing, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I. Grace of God that is of me. I am least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle. That's his first evaluation of himself that we have. He says, for one thing, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. And of course, you may remember when Paul first met Jesus, he was on the road to Damascus. He was going there to destroy the Lord's followers, he says. And a brilliant light from heaven <coughs> suddenly beamed down upon him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, sir? Saul asked. And the voice replied, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Paul never forgot that. He was the one who persecuted the church. He was not one of the original twelve, of course you know that. He needed to see the resurrection Jesus. And he did. And so he was called later to be an apostle. He had to prove himself. He had to prove his credentials to be included among the apostles, to be a leader. Of course, his conversion turned his life upside down. It turned the developing church inside out. And it remains to this day for many people, particularly Jewish folks, uh, kind of an obstruction to them. How could this Pharisee who was so opposed to the church suddenly be the apostle? Paul himself never forgot where he came from. With Paul and for all of us, I think we dare not forget where we came from. I am not responsible for my birth. I'm not responsible for my heart, my heart and my mind preparation when I first heard the gospel. I am what I am as a professional through forces and decisions and abilities, none of which were made by me alone. By the grace of God, Paul says, and I agree, I am what I am. And his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, Paul says, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. God in his grace has been at work in Paul's life and continue to be at work in Paul's life and in mine and in yours, even before we had any knowledge of God himself. By the grace of God, I am what I am. All that I am, my heritage, my strengths, my relationships, I am by the grace of God. What's Paul's response to this? His grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I work harder than any of them. My uniqueness, my unique place, my calling is my responsibility now requiring my effort, and so Paul says, I work harder. A little bragging here, maybe? Not really. Paul adds, so it was not I working harder, but the grace of God that is <coughs> even my motivations, my hard work, my integrity, I work harder than any of them. No, it was not I, but the grace of God that is within me. We recognize what we need to with Paul that it is by God's grace that we are what we are. It is by God's grace that we do what we do, our motivation, our ability to use the opportunities God has given us. It's all by God's grace. 
grace, grace, grace. Well, that's the first thing that Paul says back to the Corinthian church, maybe 57 AD. I'm the least of the apostles, unfit to be an apostle. And then he writes a letter to the Ephesian church, probably five or six years later. This is in chapter 3, verse 7. Now, this gospel I have become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. Although I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to me to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ. From the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, that's a high office, the highest, to I'm the very least of all the saints. Now Paul doesn't just compare himself with the other apostles, he compares himself with all of God's people because Paul doesn't have in his mind St. Peter or St. John or in our day St. Francis or somebody other who is a canonized saint. No, no. When he writes every one of his letters, including this one, to the Ephesians, he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. The saints are God's people. Those who are in Christ and now he says, I'm the least of all the saints. I'm the least of all God's people. Every year, for a lot of years now, I've gone to the pastor's conference in America's Keswick. And one of the things the director always says to all the pastors that are sitting there, you are my heroes. And I always feel like getting up and saying, you're wrong. Our job is to minister to people who are the heroes. They're the folks, you're the folks who are out there in the world, in your jobs, next door to your neighbors, who have to live out the Christian faith. That's my heroes, not the pastors. We got it easy. Of course, we have to do the same thing you do when we're with our neighbors, but you get my point. Paul says, I'm the least of all the same. C.S. Lewis, I don't know whether you've read The Great Divorce, but it's a, it's a fictional account of a man who goes from the outskirts of hell to the outskirts of heaven. They do it on a bus and all it's, you know, C.S. Lewis has a wonderful imagination. And the narrator who is telling the story sees a beautiful lady in heaven, coming out from heaven, as it were, bathed in an almost unbearable light, Lewis writes, with a great entourage of beings honoring her. He wonders if this is some really famous person. And his guy says, not at all. It's someone you'll never heard of. Her name on earth was Sarah Smith, and she lived at Golders Green. Well, the man says, she seems to be, well, person of particular importance. Yes, she's one of the great ones. You need to understand that fame in this country and on earth are two quite different things. Although I'm the very least, Paul says, of all the saints, I become a servant according to the gift of God's grace that was given me by the working of his power. I become a servant According to the gift of God's grace. God has given me the grace to become a servant. I have the honor of being a servant. Servant? Not a boss. Not the chief. Not the guy with the corner office. A unique dispute, Luke tells us, rose among Jesus' disciples as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. And Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the one who serves. For who is greatest? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? 
No, but I'm among you and one who serves. The standard of greatness, the standard of leadership is serving, serving others. Again, remember Gar's Terence Goodman's analysis of real leadership, humility, empathy, integrity, caring more about the cause than the self. This grace was given to me, Paul says, to bring to the Gentiles the news of the boundless riches of Christ. That's his purpose. That's what matters in living out his days, and I've maintained for you and I as well. To bring to others the news of the boundless riches of Christ. The boundless riches. The privilege of knowing him. The privilege of knowing his love, his peace, purpose that comes through knowing him. Most of all, knowing him. Well, from the least to the apostles, not worthy to be called an apostle, but the least of all the saints, Paul writes this near the end of his life, maybe in 65 AD, one of his last letters in any case, to his son in the faith, Simeon, in the first chapter Verse 12, he says, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So from unfit to be an apostle, to the very least of all the saints, now of sinners I am the foremost. Seems strange, doesn't it? The climax of lifelong witness as an apostle to the grace of God in this way. We, we would think that he might have started with I'm the worst of sinners, and I'm the least of the saints, and, and, and I'm the, the least of the apostles. You know, kind of going from sinner to saint to apostle. No, he goes the other way. Early on, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of all the saints, and now I'm the worst of sinners. Paul stood in all, right to the end of his life. God and Christ would forgive him. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me, he says, the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. If God could save me, Paul says, nobody's lost. Paul, the great apostle, said, I'm the foremost of sinners. I require God's utmost patience. I may have said this to you before, but I'm the worst sinner I know. I don't know your hearts. I don't know what you do every day. I don't know your thinking. I just know me. So I'm the worst sinner I know. But how thankful I am, and I trust you are too, that you can say, this saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, even me. He didn't come to condemn me. He loved me and came to save me. So with Paul, I can say the grace of our Lord overflowed to me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And I'm with David. I can 
say, do you deal with everyone this way, O sovereign Lord? What more can I say? You know what I'm really like, sovereign Lord. But for the sake of your promise and according to your will, you've done great things for me. How great you are. Grace. We talk about grace in every one of these passages. Did you notice it? It's the one word that appears every time. By the grace of God, I am what I am, Paul said. This grace was given to me, he said. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me in the third verse. Grace, grace, grace. As a leader, Paul recognized that his gifts, his position, were gifts of God, grace of God. He sees his relationship to the people he served as a servant, the people he leads, just like his Lord. He sees his relationship to his Lord as one of grace, the grace of God's love and forgiveness. So as Paul ends the passage in Timothy, I, I want to proclaim with you that the king of the ages, the mortal and invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Well, if we're going to talk about grace, what do we have to sing? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing grace. And I, and I have included all five stanzas that are in our book. There's more stanzas, by the way, that, that do wrote, but uh, these are enough. Uh, the second stanza is, is very precious to me because, and I don't know whether I mentioned this to you before, but I became a Christian as a, as a young boy because I was so afraid of death. And Newton says, it was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears knew. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. Right? I can say amen to that. Amazing grace, how sweet.
now is our prayer time. Time to lift up, lift up our thoughts, our needs, our joys and sorrows to a loving, merciful God who runs down the road with wide open arms to all of us bosses. Uh, Mr. Wainwright? I'd like to have prayers for my brother Marvin, who will be gone, according to the doctor, pretty soon to have dialysis. To begin dialysis, he's beginning it or right. he's beginning dialysis. Yes. He not the exact date yet, but very soon. Okay. Lord, we pray you be with Marvin. We pray that uh, you give him the uh, the strength and the certainly the uh, patience to undergo dialysis. It's not an easy process, Lord, as as we don't have to tell you these things, but. Um, we pray, Lord, you use it, use that process to give him good health and strength and many, many years, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Amen. We have a, a group of folks who have been affected by the virus. Uh, we pray especially for Wayne Reeves, who was the AV installer in the church. Uh, also for Roland Newell, Jack Harkins, and Rick Cheslow, uh, who were exposed to the virus last week and um, have received, uh, from what I understand, uh, negative reports, yeah. which is a good thing. And also, finally, for Polly Grabelny, who was infected with the virus, but my understanding is that she is uh, experiencing a very positive recovery along with her family. So God's praise for, for yeah. bringing her through that. Lord, we do pray for these folks and, and others who, many more, what is it, a million, a million a day now, or whatever it is, that are exposed, Lord, that uh, you would protect them, that there would not be any of the symptoms that can be so debilitating and, and even fatal. And Lord, we, we pray for this vaccine as it becomes available, that people would, would take it, uh, use it, that uh, this virus might uh, come to an end, this pandemic might come to an end in a, in a a good period of time, as short as period of time as, as possible. We, we pray, Lord, that people would not be so fatigued uh, from all the safety measures that we are called to, to exercise and that uh, we together, Lord, and, and certainly uh, as I think about the, the pandemic, I think about the political controversies that uh, we continue to experience and I think it's everybody's desire, Lord, that there be a unity in the nation around the things that really matter, that justice would be done, that integrity would prevail, that um, we would be the witnesses uh, as a city on a hill, as it were, to the world and what we do and what we say. So, Lord, be with us as a nation, be with our leaders, and uh, especially be with those who are experiencing the worst parts of this pandemic. And again, we ask all this in the name of Jesus. We have a request for healing. Uh, first for John Shiroji, who had a recent heart attack. We ask prayers for his recovery. Also for Reverend John Fordyce, who was in the hospital after a cardiac event requiring a stent. Uh, for Brianna, a seven-year-old who was fighting lymphoma cancer. Uh, for Roland and Janet Newell's granddaughter, Kelsey, who has suffered a, bro a broken arm recently. Continued prayers for Wendy Casper. Uh, for healing and comfort for Wendy Pearl, who is dealing with complications from a liver transplant. Also for Brittany Zier, as she is battling a serious long-term illness. And for Jennifer Cox, as she is battling, also bat battling a serious long-term illness. Lord, as we listen to some of these uh, diagnoses and prognoses and all the rest of it, we were overwhelmed by the seriousness of illness that certainly strike us as human beings. And yet, Lord, we're, we're at the same time thankful we live in an age in which we live where a lot of this can be treated, uh, stents and, and uh, chemo and surgery and all the things that bring about healing and lord as we as we think about that we have to think about those who are serving in hospitals doctors and nurses and 
the other kind of caregivers and just those who take care of the rooms and all the things that have to be done and they're, they've been under a lot of stress. I heard one saying it's like running a marathon and then being asked to run an Ironman race right afterwards. Uh, so Lord, uh, strengthen them, encourage them, and, and provide the care that people are needing more and more. And Lord, for those who have chronic illnesses, continual pain, continual other kinds of, of symptoms, Lord, that's, that continue day after day after day, be with them, encourage them, and, and we would always pray for your healing, for the removal of those symptoms uh, by your grace, Lord. We have a request from Becky Jensen. Uh, she Plus, continued prayers for the pastor nominating committee as they carry on the mission for not just searching for a pastor, but for the pastor that has God's name on it for this church. Amen. And be with, be with those who are on that committee, Lord. Uh, give them the patience and the uh, just the, the long range view and the, the, the continual strength to keep going on and on. Lord, we pray in, in your time, but of course we're asking for it to be as short as possible that you would send your person to uh, shepherd this congregation in, in the name of Jesus. Two requests for prayers for, for moms, uh, from, from Margo Mattis for her mother Jean Miller, and also from Robin McCarter for her mother Betty Jenkins who is residing in the Masonic home. Lord, we, we do pray for our older generation, and especially those who are in, in homes uh, where there, initially there was a lot of, of loss due to the pandemic, and, and it's still happening in some of the homes. And so, Lord, we just ask for protection and, and your encouragement. Um, many of us, as we age, need your continued encouragement, Lord, and subject to depression and all kinds of things that happen. And Lord, we just ask for your grace for us, all of us who are older, and especially for those who are confined, uh, that they might know your strength and your peace and your love, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Also, there are prayers for uh, continued safety and God's blessing as we continue our live worship services here in the church. And a, a special thanks to Chris Patel and to Vaughn and to Victor and to Phil uh, for picking up the slack with the recent uh, depletion of the team. Yeah, we, we just uh, we continue to pray that the team would test negative and be back. Uh, I guess next week they can come back. Uh, and Lord, we just thank you for those who are filling in and also have been with us from the very beginning. Uh, thank you. I, I personally thank you, Lord, for the faithfulness of folks in this church. And finally, Reverend, there's a uh, then all the tumult and, and bad news. There is one uh, big speck of good news. Uh, today is Jack Harkin's birthday. Uh, he's completed another trip around the sun, and we'd like to sing happy birthday to him. <laughs>
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ.